My name is Mark Lafage, and I'm the CEO of Genome, Genome Canada. Uh, we have a, a big subject and a short uh, 45 minutes to cover it in. This is the biology section of the, uh, the innovation uh, program. And uh, one of the uh, commandments, the 11th commandment, is that you should never do biology without slides. So we are going to have slides on our section a little bit, just to put context. So uh, I'm going to start, and I will introduce the panelists in a second, and we'll have some questions, and then you'll, those of you who wish to ask questions can go ahead. And I'm going to try to get my slides up. Here we go. Uh, the biology, uh, we certainly use a lot of software. We do have big data explosion in our field, but we're still in biology. So it's a little bit of a different uh, environment. It's an important environment, and in the context of an innovation strategy, uh, e easily forgotten. So let me go back. Um, just for context, we, we call this panel the life sciences, and often when we do life sciences panels in Canada, we're actually talking about the biopharmaceutical world, biotechnology, uh, pharmaceutical, ph the pharma sector, uh, medical uh, devices, and we forget there's another arm in, in this world, which is the uh, bio industries, let's call it agriculture, uh, ag food, forestry, fisheries, which is uh, another arm of the life sciences industry, and very big arm. Now, if you think of health, um, uh, health in Canada, the uh, mid-sized industry, good growth profile, but of course the public sector in health, the people who work in hospitals, community clinics, is enormous. Actually, it's the single biggest glob of activity and employment of everything in Canada. So if you're doing an innovation strategy or growth strategy, health has to be in there. It's just too big to ignore. And uh, if we take the other side, the agriculture, uh, fish, forestry bit, uh, I saw finance uh, data, uh, and there it's much more of a private enterprise, very big companies. Uh, there are 2.5 million Canadians working in this sector. It's the single biggest industrial employer, if you want, in Canada. Has the interest of being both uh, urban, it's in Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, and rural. It covers, uh, it's a very inclusive uh, sector. And, uh, but suffers a little bit from being um, uh, deemed to be, uh, you know, old industries and in, in uh, decline, which is, I think, more a perception than a reality. Uh, so, uh, if you put those two things together, this is a big clump. If, uh, if uh, Mr. Barton, who's uh, working on the growth agenda for Canada, uh, doesn't have this uh, as part of his growth, if there's no growth in this clump of life sciences, it's hard to imagine how the whole Canadian economy can grow. It's just too big. Uh, taken together. Uh, there is a bit of a link, uh, and, and uh, it's not the only driver of science, but the human genome uh, was sequenced in 2000, the, the, the draft sequence, the, the publication in Science and Nature was 2003, and even then we hadn't finished. It was almost 2010 before the whole thing was finished, and it's a big technology wave that's driving both uh, human health and the uh, ag agri-food sector. Uh, and it's just starting to show up. So if you make the analogy to the internet, this is like we're just in 1990. This wave is going to be with us for 50 years, and what we're seeing now is just the beginning of it, not, not the end. The, 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 the human genome is not finished, it's actually just starting. And uh, uh, so it will be on, those, on those, both those sides. Uh, one of the innovations uh, uh, that uh, Canada did, uh, John Manley was here on the previous panel, actually, the, the Canada launched Genome Canada in 2000, and I just wanted to make the comment, and in 2000, people were leaving, in, in genomics, were leaving this country because there's nothing. Uh, if you fast forward today, there's probably 2,000, 2,500 people working on uh, Genome Canada funded projects across the country, and each one of those projects has uh, applicants from Stanford, from uh, Berkeley, from Cambridge, from the Max Planck Institute. It's a completely different environment, and as you can see, uh, we've fundamentally been doing science for 10, 12 years, and now we're going to, we're going to see uh, some of the first outputs of that science. Um, yesterday, uh, the excellent presentation on artificial intelligence, there was a comment made about the importance of, uh, for example, artificial intelligence and the link to personalized medicine, uh, which is often the term used in, in other countries. 
Uh, but in Canada, we've stretched that, and I, we've really we're talking about personalized health because uh, we have a pretty big portfolio of projects, and we've got some in, in public health prevention, for example, uh, breast cancer sc screening for uh, prevention strategies or, or uh, uh, prenatal testing. Uh, diagnosis, diagnostics, I think we're going to cover that today. Uh, treatment, it is uh, medical uh, discovery, drug discovery, and prognosis. So the predictive tools, for, particularly in cancer, for how a, a disease evolves over time. And I think uh, it's one of the innovations in Canada is that we've stretched uh, what we are doing across that spectrum. The other thing that you should know is we have, a, by international standards, a very big uh, clinically oriented personal health portfolio. So if you're at the NIH right now, this would probably be your descriptor of the Canadian, uh, the Canadian program. Uh, the last thing I would say about innovation, to go back to John Manley, is one of the uh, innovations we have, of course, we have technology innovation, the genomics, the sequencing, all of that, but we also had a business model innovation in that if you look at the uh, genome program in the United States, there's a human genome program, there's a separate program for agriculture. There's a separate program for energy and, and genomics. It's the same thing in Europe. And uh, in Canada, we've combined that. There's a, one program for all of that. Uh, about half of our activities in human health. The other half is in the agro-food and forestry sector. And one of the, um, uh, the results or one of the benefits of that uh, innovation in the business model is that the heavy technology investment in the human genome, which created the sequencer, created the bioinformatic tools, the, the sample prep work, which was all done and paid for by the human genome, was transferred very rapidly in this country to agriculture and forestry and explains how we've had so much, uh, I think, success and it's a bit of a sleeper. I won't spend too much time. I'll do one, one uh, context uh, on, on the uh, ag uh, uh, food sector and link it to climate change. As I mentioned, it's a big area. Uh, I thought you might find it interesting. These are Canadian exports, $500 billion a year. Uh, you know, we often think of the, the cars, about 90 billion, oil and gas. And if you look at the bottom, the bioeconomy, our traditional industries, food, farming, it doesn't even include the pharma bit. It's 100 billion. It's a, it's a big, the biggest single chunk of our export, and it's, I think it's representative of what, uh, what we have. Uh, climate uh, can be seen in two ways and has a big impact in this whole area. Uh, it can be a real downer. We're going to have longer droughts. We're going to have uh, invasive species. Uh, you could, you know, if you don't do anything about it, you could have your 100 billion going to 80 billion. Uh, on the other hand, in a country like Canada, northern country, where uh, heat is an issue, uh, by adjusting the genetics, doing, in a sense, a software upgrade on the DNA of plants, DNA of animals, DNA of fish, uh, you adopt, adapt the genetics so that you have uh, plant species that are drought resistant, pest resistant. You can imagine a scenario where the 100 billion goes to 150 billion as we move up the value scale and as we expand the growing area uh, in, this, in this field. With that, We'll switch gears now and go back to uh, health. I'll introduce uh, Robert here. Bob is a founder of Sterling Ventures, has been in venture capital for 36 years. So if you, in dog years, that's he's 200 years old. I first met him and I was Consul General uh, of, uh, of uh, Canada in San Francisco. We reopened the office. It was on almost my first meeting because Bob had invested in a startup at McGill. Uh, so 10 years ago, I know he's done about three, four things since then, so he doesn't, never stops. Uh, I'll let him give his story, give three to five minutes, and then we'll loop back for questions. Oh, yes, it is this way. No, you're on, I think. I'm on? Okay. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, yes, yeah, Sanderling Ventures has been around for a fair amount of time. Um, I started this when I was three years old, and um, so it's not that bad. Um, done a lot of companies uh, which have grown up to be real, real entities uh, that are quite important, uh, and this li the list is here. And I don't mean to, to say this for more than what you'll hear later on, and that is one of the reasons we're working in Montreal is we think building a sustainable company can actually make a, an industry there in, in the city because the people 
and the environment are absolutely conducive to building a real pharmaceutical industry. Um, this is our team uh, currently. We're going to add one more person in Montreal, uh, individual out of Novartis, uh, but um, we, we just keep things rolling along and, and um, uh, building it. And, and the building here in Montreal, or down there in Montreal, pardon me, downriver, um, is a very important subject to us. Uh, <clears throat> set of slides here uh, are actually uh, part of a presentation to some pharma companies, so you'll see some names here uh, on them, uh, just because I grabbed them quickly at Mark's suggestion. But Dalcor was founded um, several years ago by a conversation between Jean-Claude Tardif and I in, in uh, Mark Smith's office at Pandion in, in Montreal. Where Jean-Claude said, I've got a great idea, I'm going to save the world, and uh, I, uh, yeah, I'll listen. Um, and it turned out it was a very interesting uh, project in, in, uh, with genomics attached to it, very strongly, as you'll see. Developed a very strong scientific advisory board um, and, and, and other consultants to, to make sure we could pull off this project deals with uh, cardiovascular disease, people who've had ACS, uh, go to the hospital, uh, and there are a set of drugs, all of which thus far have failed. Their phase three clinical trial failed. Um, but this particular drug, when you looked at it from the standpoint of genomics, actually had for a section of the population a 39% decrease in heart outcomes. You go to the hospital, you've had a cardiovascular event, you take this drug, and if you have the right genome, you have a 39% less chance of having another heart attack. So, big numbers. This is the original data that uh, Jean-Claude showed me. Um, I told him at the time, he, he said, I want $50 million to do a clinical trial, and I said, fine, I'll give you 50. Um, I knew that was, you know, <laughs> not the right number. But, it, but very interesting. My partner was a member of the, third member of the management team of Genentech, so I was very close to Herceptin and, and genomics and oncology, I thought this was a very important finding. We did a, what they call a GWAS, or found that there was retrospective analysis of the trial which had failed and found that there was a, a, a loci where if you were adenosine, adenosine in this loci, sorry for the technology, you did 39% better, as you just saw. Moreover, in a separate study, we took this, took this knowledge and we said we are now predicting, so this is a prospective study, in this database that those patients who were adenosine, adenosine at this loci would have a thinning of their atherosclerotic plaque in the carotids, and that's what happened. We then took this one step further and said, we're going to show that a marker which says something's wrong declines in the AAs and increases in, the, in those patients who are in that same loci or guanosine, guanosine. Genomics. Sorry for the language, but we have to get used to it. This is concordant information, uh, I, I will add. And then we did the same thing with what they call efflux, or what's the health of your macrophages in your body. And the adenosine, adenosine were very healthy, and the guanosine, guanosine were very sick. Moreover, if you took this data and looked at it, you would say, in every case, in these four prospective trials, there was a genotype-dependent response. One of the most important scientists in this field, when he first saw this, a gentleman out of Harvard, said, wow, genotype dose response. Not quite the right uh, verbiage, but that's okay. He picked it up immediately. And I have seen the jaws drop on one major KOL after another when they see this data. So I think we're on to something. We're doing a phase three clinical trial. This is being done, conducted out of Montreal, out of uh, Montreal Heart. This is a 5,000 patient trial, 
screening 33,000 plus patients to get it to five because we have to get the AAs. This is a very, very large trial right out of Montreal, the headquarters for biotechnology of the world. <laughs> These are our sites <clears throat> that we've recruited <clears throat> and we're screening patients today. Uh, current curve, this is actually old. <clears throat> the number of patients screened is now 250. So this was done a couple weeks ago, growing very rapidly. And believe me, the pharma industry is looking at this very, very carefully. So that's what um, Dalcor is all about. We think we can build a sustainable company there. We think we can do others. We're working on another one right now. Large company, sustainable. We're not going to flip this. We think if we build something, we'll actually end up being better off for our limited partners than just doing a sale where I make a bunch of money and everybody else and the drug companies get the benefit and the local community does not. End of pitch. Thank you very much. Uh, one comment, I, I think you've implied it, but I think uh, uh, just to fill out, I think this year, if I'm not mistaken, between the two financings and Del Delcor, uh, it's 150 million so far. The 50 million has grown a little bit. The, uh, <laughs> the 150 million, yeah, it is 150 million dollars. We closed in April of this year, and we're working on pharma partners and other financing now. The total trial is 250 million dollars. That's 50 percent less than the pharma industry says they think they would have done it, and they can't imagine how we're doing this trial. But we have great people. Okay. So then uh, we're moved to Diane Gasnet. Diane was uh, at a time, for a time uh, in the venture capital uh, industry at the Fonds Solidarité, and then has moved into one of the things that John Manley raised, the, uh, I think, consortiums of research interaction, and runs uh, CQDM, uh, and has been running it for, for a number of years. And, and uh, CQ, it's, I'll get you to speak about CQDM, but also a little bit on the innovations in the business model and the evolution. CQDM originally was a, a Centre Québécois de Développement des Médicaments. Now it's become national and international, so it's CQDM, I think. You could perhaps speak to that as well. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marc. So I'm um, very pleased to be here today. Uh, CQDM is um, what we would call a multi-stakeholder consortium. So we were created in 2008, uh, initially by three big pharma companies, Merck, Pfizer, and AstraZeneca, together with the federal government and the provincial, the Quebec government. So, uh, and right now we have expanded this a little bit. Uh, so we have nine big pharma companies supporting CQDM, uh, again, also with the federal and the Quebec government. So. Um, all the big ones are there. So the mission then, the, the reason why CQDM was created uh, initially was really uh, because the pharma industry was uh, facing a lot of pressure to put some new drugs on the market as quickly as possible. And I can tell you it's certainly still the, the, the case right now. Um, and at that time, uh, we all faced the, the problem of, of, of the productivity of the research in general. So. The, the, the whole uh, concept of developing a molecule is extremely long, very costly, and very risky. So at that time, pharma companies were saying, well, we would like to address this lack of productivity, but we cannot afford to do that because we are pressed to put some new molecules on the market. So we need to do something about that, and the best way to do this uh, and to approach this would be to work together. Now, as you can imagine, three big pharma companies trying to, to imagine how can they work together was a little bit of a challenge. Um, but uh, we came up with a model that is, I think, innovative. Uh, it was in innovative at that time and still is. And it's, uh, it's really uh, a concept of collaboration uh, with all the stakeholders. So, so basically, we, put, we take all the money from CQDM we put this in a picky bank and we use this to fund all the research projects. So CQDM basically is running calls for proposals and competitions and we pick up the best projects and we fund these projects initially in Quebec, now across Canada. 
And uh, so we use this, this money to, uh, to fund all the research projects uh, at CQDM. So the concept is that all the sponsors are sharing the cost of the research and they are sharing the benefits. Um, and because we have that, so we, we can create really a, an impressive leverage of up to 25 fold. So it means that for a dollar a pharma would put into CQDM, we can match it with $25 of research, of dollars of, uh, of new, uh, new dollars of research. So it's a leverage that uh, allow us to really um, fund really true innovation, uh, take risk and go a little bit early in the process uh, and find things that a pharma uh, or a single organization would not be able to fund otherwise. Um, and it's, it's working pretty well. We have uh, so far uh, funded 60 different technologies for about 43 million. Uh, I, initially, as I was saying, in Quebec, but we expanded this to Canada. It made it a lot of sense because we really want to foster collaboration, not only with the pharma industry and, and the people we are funding, but among the funding that we are providing, we want to see public-private collaboration. Because we are truly, truly uh, inspired by the fact that if we want to find real solutions to very complex problems, we need to work all of us together. Um, one key, I see that time is really flying, so I'm trying to, I will try to be as uh, brief as possible, but I would like to highlight um, one of the key points at CQDM is this mentorship program that we have put together. So mentorship program is basically for each project that we are funding, our pharma partners have a right to elect a mentor. A mentor is a senior scientist that they identify within their own organization at the global level. So the mentors are meeting with the investigators twice a year and their role is to, and you can have many mentors on a given project because we have many pharma uh, sponsoring the project. Um, so, so the mentors, the, the, the role of the mentors is really to make sure that what we are doing here is aligned with uh, the ultimate needs of the, of the pharma industry. So I can tell you this is working extremely well. So for the, for the researchers, it's a, uh, um, a great opportunity to, to, to know what's going on in the pharma industry and interact for, with pharma and uh, initiate true partnerships uh, with pharma industry. So we see at the end of the project funded by CQDM, we see a lot of um, real long-term partnerships and this is exactly what we're trying to, to achieve uh, with this funding. Uh, I'm sure that we have some other opportunity to, um, to give examples of, uh, of the value that we can create. One thing I would like to highlight to finish with is that this is all nice to say that we want to work together, but um, really the challenge is to find a way to um, create benefits for everyone. And there's no magic recipe for that. We, you need to sit down look at, the, at the, 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 the different stakeholders that you have on the given project and find a way. Uh, and for that, I think we need to have creativity and, and there's no limit in the type of model that we can build. It's really up to us. So a, uh, a very uh, innovative model, pretty unique, I think, in, in Canada. And uh, well done, we'll, we'll loop back. So. Uh, we've had if, into the ecosystem research, venture capital, pharma. So we we have pharma colleagues in the, in the audience. So we also we also like pharma. <laughs> we like venture capital, but at the end we have entrepreneurs. And uh, Mike Moffat yesterday said, uh, you know, Canadian Canadians. One of the criticisms were a bunch of uh, I think slappers. I think he described it. Uh, there are no slappers on the panel. If, if you're looking for a slapper panel, this is the wrong panel. Uh, Tyler, uh, none more than Tyler. Tyler Wish is uh, from Newfoundland, originally from uh, the other coast. Uh, studied genetics and has uh, started a uh, company. He'll tell us about that. He is also on uh, Minister Bain's advisory panel for uh, innovation. So he might have some observations from that. I think having gone to Boston and he, all over the place. So Tyler. Sure. Um, well, thanks very much, Mark, and thanks for having me on the panel. Uh, and also thanks and congratulations to Canada 2020. I think these forums, these discussions are so important, and you've pulled together a great group of people to have uh, to have a dialogue today. 
Uh, so again, thanks, Mark, and um, I'll tell you a bit about my entrepreneurial story uh, at Sequence Bio, and, uh, as well as some observations from the work this past summer with, um, with Minister Baines. So uh, myself and Chris Gardner, who's here today, founded a company called Sequence Bio. We're based in St. John's, Newfoundland, Labrador. We got really excited a few years ago about new opportunities, new technologies uh, that were going to disrupt um, the drug discovery space and the healthcare space. And those um, technologies, of course, were high-throughput sequencing technologies, um, but also the computational opportunities or leveraging AI and machine learning. Um, and thirdly, mobile technologies to capture data. And it was very clear you know, a couple of years ago that, that this was gonna really revolutionize uh, drug discovery. And, and just to give a bit of context or background um, for why that is, um, I would argue that the drug discovery business hasn't changed fundamentally in 40, 50 years. We've uh, relied on the same technologies, um, and perhaps one of the biggest issues is that we've relied um, on non-human models to understand human biology for 50 years. We've relied on animal models, cellular models, in vitro models to understand humans and how therapeutics uh, could be applied. And of course, there's this fundamental disconnect between these approaches and who the end user is, humans, uh, and that has resulted in a diminished um, sort of success uh, ratio in terms of bringing new therapeutics to market. Um, it's resulted in a lot of challenges in terms of the clinical development process. Only about 10% of all products or compounds that enter phase one clinical trials become successful. And when we do get those drugs to market, they often don't work as intended in heterogeneous disease populations. But things have changed. There's now an opportunity to generate an enormous amount of data information on humans. Your omics, your phenotype, leveraging your mobile devices, uh, electronic biosensor, electronic data capture, biosensors, et cetera, et cetera. This is fundamentally changing the way in which we can dive much more deeply into human biology uh, in a way that we never could before. And so it's, it's tremendously exciting times. We are just at the infancy of this, as, as Mark mentioned, but I don't think there's anyone that doubts that this is the future of healthcare. This is the future of drug discovery, the opportunity, the ability to engage all of you um, as a partner in the process to generate huge amounts of information and uh, ultimately um, be more successful in terms of innovation and commercialization. So we started a company in Newfoundland Labrador to, to um, create an opportunity to leverage these technologies. Uh, what we've done is um, uh, prepared to launch one of the world's most ambitious human genome sequencing projects. We are aiming to sequence uh, approximately 20, 25% of the entire Newfoundland Labrador population um, and use that data in conjunction with their electronic health records um, to amass a, a resource of information that can then be um, applied uh, for drug discovery, leveraging these exciting tools. I think if you look at organizations like 23andMe, like Regeneron, um, like Decode Amgen, of course, it is clear that there is a real shift in how we are thinking about using data, large-scale big data, uh, to do drug discovery in a different way. And so, um, we're, we feel like we're at the right place at the right time. Certainly the right time in Newfoundland Labrador, if you don't know, is, is a really remarkable place from a population genetics perspective. Um, and it's really an incredible opportunity to do something world-class in Canada. Not just in Newfoundland Labrador, but something world-class in Canada. And we're so proud of that. Um, of course, as Mark, as I mentioned already, it's, it's in its early infancy, but uh, the opportunity to do something world-class, to build a big Canadian company is something that's very important and meaningful to us. Um, I would add that um, there's another part of this project that I'm, I'm extremely proud about, and um, it's, the, it's the model that we've created to, to, to lead and launch a successful initiative. And that model is uh, about engaging participants and all stakeholders, government, healthcare, patients, and families as partners in this process. I think um, there's new thinking and, uh, around how particularly patients and families want to be a part of the research process, want to be more engaged. And so we've worked really hard with our policymakers, with our healthcare providers and our communities to create an initiative that not only supports innovative cutting edge science, but also benefits the participants who engage in us by returning this information to them so that they can make better decisions about their healthcare um, for themselves, for their family members. This data also gets used and shared with healthcare providers so that they can also make better decisions uh, and improve the care of their, of their uh, patient populations. And finally, policymakers are proposed to have access to the information so that they can make better decisions about healthcare utilization and delivery. So we're really 
proud and excited about finding the right model where everyone wins and the kind of the community-centric lens with which we've taken to make this a success. Finally, uh, I'll just make a comment on, on the federal innovation strategy or agenda. Um, I had the fortune of hosting three different roundtables, one in Ottawa, one in St. John's, and one in Boston, uh, around um, soliciting ideas uh, for how we leverage our scientific excellence, how we um, promote an entrepreneurial and creative society, and how we can establish stronger, more robust clusters and partnerships. Um, we heard some really clear signals. I think uh, Minister Baines and his team are, are starting to share and disseminate those ideas. I think a lot of them actually are, have been echoed here today and yesterday, so um, that is great to hear. I think, um, again, these discussions are so important as we help to shape the innovation strategy for the country going forward. Quickly on Boston, um, that discussion was about clusters and partnerships, and I went there to get a different perspective, a different lens. Of course, Boston has this incredible powerful, robust innovation ecosystem, particularly in the life sciences. And the question was asked, you know, how did that develop? You know, how did that come to be? And, and what role did policymakers and governments play in that? And you probably, you won't be shocked to hear that they, they really felt that, you know, kind of set the right conditions, remove risk and barriers, and otherwise kind of get, get out of the way, right? Um, that being said, they had incredible infrastructure there. They had those great universities. And I think the biggest takeaway for me in terms of the Boston innovation story is that it's about culture and people. You had initially three organizations, Biogen, Genzyme, and one other, and they, the founders of those companies, got together and said, we're gonna do this. We're gonna be successful. We're gonna work together. We're gonna educate our policymakers. We're gonna work with our, all the other stakeholders. And I think that was a really powerful message around culture, collaboration, partnership uh, for this country going forward. I'll leave it there. Okay, um, we're gonna, we have a, just a few minutes. Uh, those of you who want have questions, if you start moving up, uh, I'm gonna ask, uh, go back to everybody, and uh, in terms of your observations on the uh, inno Canadian innovation system, uh, Jen started the discussion, but uh, Bob, I know you, you have a few thoughts, uh, and uh, we might come back, uh, and I'll start with you on that one. The amount of innovation, <coughs> innovation here is fabulous. The people that can actually get the work done is fabulous. I did a, a project in chemistry, which I didn't think anybody could do. Very complex molecule. Worked out fine. So there's lots of talent. But apropos of the last comment, what is missing, the biggest missing piece, is entrepreneurs who can carry this forward. We're spending a lot of time and effort on taking people in, mentoring them, because you need to build one or two companies which stay, and that's the foundation of what happened in San Francisco, which I lived through and was part of, uh, what happened in Boston, that little town over there on the East Coast. Uh, and we'd like to do that in Montreal as well. Uh, Diana, I have a different, maybe I, I get you to speak. Uh, Montreal, I had a very tough time. I was working in Montreal for four years, and it was kind of the years when most of the pharmaceutical research centers closed down in Montreal, and it, uh, it was a point of pride, and it, I think it hit the community very hard, and now we talk about the new pharma model. Uh, company employment doesn't seem to have sh increased very much, but there are tons of people working in labs, uh, like in Robert's example, they're doing clinical research, I think, of the, out of the Montreal Neurological Institute, not the Neurological Institute, the Heart Institute. Uh, you are, there are more consortiums coming in. So there's more people working in, in research centers, in a sense, funded by industry. Um, the tax rate is the same whether you work in a company or uh, the income tax rate is the same whether you work in a company or you work at a university. Uh, do we have to change the way we count uh, jobs in this sector? It's kind of an interesting uh, question. This is a tough question. <laughs> um, for, so first yeah. of all, just I want to say that um, it's true that uh, we had a very strong pharma presence in, in Montreal, and this is precisely w why CQDM was created. 
Uh, and uh, now that we see this model shifting, we see some great opportunity for CQDM and other groups like that who can really uh, link the academic research and uh, what's done in, in small company, uh, biotech companies with the pharma industry. So there are still a lot of extremely great opportunities in, in this uh, new model and, and I think that we are all working in that direction. Now, um, coming back to your question about job, uh, of course, jobs are very important, and I think that we still have a lot of uh, great job in this industry. It's just very, very difficult to count this. From CQDM point of view, uh, we are able to measure the, the jobs that we are creating or supporting directly, but indirectly, especially with this virtual model, it's becoming more and more difficult. And I wish I would have some help to um, create some new metrics and new ways to measure that because it's extremely important if we want to show that investment from pharma and other industrials uh, is making a difference. Uh, Tyler, I'll go back to you, Tyler the entrepreneur. Uh, I know uh, money is so easy to get, maybe not. <laughs> You've done well. I think you had to go pretty far to get funded. Eh? But perhaps you could speak about those challenges, particularly in a, a new company and uh, your, your observations, if any? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I think our story is uh, similar to the challenges, uh, similar to the stories and the challenges of, that all Canadian companies face. Uh, we're a little bit disconnected. Uh, we've, we've got an inferiority complex. Um, and being in Newfoundland and Labrador, just from a geographical perspective, I mean, it's even more, it was even more challenging in the early days to, to, uh, to connect with, with people around financing and partnerships. Um, you know, I think overall, my observations in Canada is that we do fairly well on the early, sta early, early stages. There is, you know, an active uh, angel investment network. There are grants and funding opportunities available to early stage entrepreneurs. Um, I think I just heard in the last panel, the challenges are on the growth side of um, financing successful capital intensive businesses here in Canada. And that's problematic, of course, because the pull of American or foreign investment often often drags those companies away and the innovation and the people. So um, for us as a company, uh, particularly where we're so tied, deeply tied to our community, it's important that we remain Canadian, um, that we remain uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, our, our story was one of um, just hustle, I would say. We, we just um, buckled up and um, made a commitment to spend time in Boston, spend time in San Francisco, network and connect with people, like-minded people who shared the same vision around democratizing data and genomics and benefiting healthcare. And when you spend time in those two places in particular, um, it's amazing just how there's this strong gravitational pull or effect and you end up finding the right people quickly. Um, we were fortunate, um, I should say, early on to get funded to the tune of about a million dollars from local investors, including the provincial government of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, the optics of that is very good, the commitment is very good, particularly where stakeholder engagement is so important. Um, but most recently we raised about four, three million US, led by a group out of Silicon Valley by the name of Data Collective. Uh, they manage about uh, 600 million dollars, um, are probably the most active investor in the world in AI and machine learning. So very fortunate, very fortunate, um, you know, and that, um, that financing is more than just the, the, the money, the capital, of course. Um, that relationship with Data Collective has now built relationships in the Bay Area with Stanford and great people out of there with industry, uh, with mentors, with human resources. So, um, so far, so great. Um, but of course, um, you know, we're, we're out fundraising again. Um, and uh, look forward to being successful early next year. Well, uh, thanks to Canada 2020, you can meet uh, Robert McNeil, who, uh, and you can go see him in Montreal, save all that long trip across the continent. It'd be great. Um, the, uh, Robert, you've done uh, uh, many investments in Canada, I think, over the years. I don't know how many. Uh, your recent ones, you seem to be in the um, a model that, uh, how would you say, the... Uh, uh, lean and mean model and kind of subcontracting. Is that uh, a more permanent feature or just happens to be for this uh, particular project? Or? We find that, uh, we find that the, um, uh, the, the projects we have uh, allow us to use CROs. Each time you do a different company, you have a different type of person you need. And so utilizing CROs when you're going preclinical and into the clinic 
is, is very cost effective. We do have people on board who can do the work on a clinical level, particularly phase one, phase two. That works out quite well. Again, it's cost effective. Um, and if we get a result, then it becomes a very different uh, picture. And that's one which we're delving into right now with Dalcor because we're now in a phase three trial which will end in a few years and we'll, we're gonna be dealing with, uh, let's see, the, the quote on our first batch of drug as we go into the NDA is 2,000 tons. So I'm not gonna do that in my backyard, thank you. <laughs> we have uh, one, we're gonna do a wrap up, uh, one quick question and. Uh... Great, thank you, Mark. Lasha Babiak from Johnson & Johnson. Um, a comment and also a question. A comment, I was delighted to come back uh, last night uh, from uh, a global uh, government affairs meeting that Johnson Johnson held in Boston. Uh, where we got a great overview of the uh, Massachusetts Life Sciences uh, strategy, which is super. Uh, we heard from our global, uh, one of our global leads on innovation, and I heard fantastic things being said about Canada for the first time ever. Um, you know, Johnson Johnson la uh, has launched J Labs in uh, in Toronto, and they've gotten more visibility now to the kind of science, the kind of entrepreneurship, the kind of possibilities that exist in Canada. So it was just ph phenomenal to hear that. But back to the Massachusetts Life Sciences uh, strategy. I mean, quite an uh, aggressive strategy that uh, Massachusetts uh, launched. And we heard stats just about how successful they've been in taking those you know, initial um, steps by the, the companies you mentioned to a totally different level in terms of what they've been able to accomplish there. So curious, with the innovation agenda, with Minister Bain's efforts, do you have any thoughts about what can be done to address kind of the fragmented approach we currently have in Canada towards supporting life sciences. Do you have any thoughts on how the federal government and provincial governments could work together to make Canada a real draw for foreign direct investment and a real place for life sciences to thrive? Anybody wanna go at? Tyler, why don't you have I a... I say a few words. Um, uh, that's great to hear about uh, Canada being recognized uh, and in a positive way. Um, you know, I think it goes uh, back to these points about, um, uh, from a cultural perspective, um, making ourselves known, uh, raising the awareness, the profile of what Canada has to offer. Great people, great institutions, um, uh, support of federal government. Um, there are a lot of great attributes and a lot of great things happening in Canada. Um, I think you know, uh, what we can do in terms of this innovation strategy is, uh, one, I think this just the idea of connectivity. We need to embrace this within Canada, certainly. Um, we need to be able to tie our institutions, our centers of excellence with our entrepreneurs, with our, with our venture capital community, with our academic community uh, more tightly. And perhaps the, the, the more critical point there is align these, the incentives amongst all of those stakeholder groups. I feel like there is some roadblocks and barriers to this continuum working together as efficiently as it should, as efficiently as it works in the Boston or the Bay Area. So that's one thing. I, I think this, a, a second thing is um, this idea of specificity. Canada can't be great at everything. We can't be great at R and D. Let's find um, areas, sectors within the life sciences bioeconomy where we can be leaders. Uh, there's a number of them. Uh, and I think you know, a little bit of specificity around there and really um, back those in a big way. Um, I think, um, you know, um, when I mentioned connectivity, it's also connecting with areas of excellence like Boston and San Francisco. And we need to embrace those relationships and having venture capitalists like Robert here uh, invest and commit uh, time and energy into Canadian opportunities and Canadian companies and Canadian entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs is a critical element of the entire ecosystem's success. With that, uh, we're getting the hook, uh, but uh, it's uh, been a lot to cover. We can follow up after, maybe in the hall. Uh, I wanted to thank Canada 2020 for uh, carving out some room for biology. It's really an important subject. Um, we talked a lot about Montreal, but actually it's, it, it's wonderful. There's a big cluster in Toronto, and we shouldn't forget Vancouver. And you saw from Bob's uh, comments, competition is good. You know, if you're in San Francisco, that place in Boston is not that interesting, and if you're in Boston, you probably look at it the other, the same way. And, uh, you know, competition is, is good, and we have that. And uh, last item I'd like to say is just to go back to the original message. 
uh, the, the life sciences, the, the human side is big, thriving, and the agriculture, forestry, fisheries bit is also enormous, and uh, we should keep that in mind as we work up our growth strategies uh, going forward. So thank you very much, and let's uh, uh, thank our panelists uh, for a good, good session.